<clears throat> just want to let you know that um, I actually volunteered to teach this lesson. <laughs> if I, um, but anyway, so it was uh, it was a very difficult lesson for probably everybody. I heard from a couple of different people that said it was really hard, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie because it was really hard. Um, so, um, sin is just a very difficult topic. We don't like to confront it. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to admit that we sin. Um, we're going to mainly focus tonight on Psalm 32 and 51, but which talks about David. And we all know that in Psalm 51 that he, you know, that was a hard psalm for us to read. And Psalm 32 is very joyous. And, and I got to thinking, how could he have been so down and so riddled with sin and then yet be so happy and so joyful? Um, so I, I did some investigating, and we're actually going to start in chapter in 2 Samuel, uh, chapters 11 and 12. That will kind of give us a perspective of what Daniel encountered, I mean Daniel, David, what David went through that caused the deep grief um, and mourning and sin and then how he could um, experience the great joy. Uh, David, we all know who David is. He is one of the best known characters in the Bible. Um, in 1 Samuel 16, God chooses David to be king when he was only eight years old. Um, he, in, he was the eighth child um, of Jesse. Uh, he was a shepherd boy. Uh, in 1 Samuel 17, David kills Goliath with a stone and a sling. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David becomes king of Judah. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he becomes king of Israel. Remember at that time, the, the kingdoms were divided. Um, but when he became king of Israel, because he was already king of Judah, that um, ultimately reunited the kingdom of Israel. Um, he captured Jerusalem, um, which basically set up um, the rule and set up Jerusalem as the center of Israel, which it remains to this day, even though there has been some give and take and land ownership and things like that over the years, Jerusalem still does remain the center of Israel. Um, he, he was a musician. He is the greatest king in Israel's history. He was in uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, he was called a man after God's own heart. Um, he is in the lineage of Jesus, mentioned in Matthew 1. So he has a long history in the Bible, but he had a problem. He had a, he had a big problem. He had a thing for the ladies. I mean, quite honestly, he did. He had seven wives to begin with. He already had seven wives. Um, he struggled with lust. Um, although he had the many wives, in 2 Samuel uh, 11 and 12, we read that Bathsheba caught his attention. So in 2 Samuel 2, um, beginning in verse 2, I believe, um, it says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of, of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her unclean, uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. That's 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 5. So he got himself into a fine little mess. He basically had a one-night stand uh, with Bathsheba. And that's when things really turned for David. The king takes this woman who is already married to one of his mercenary soldiers and gets her pregnant. So what does he do? What does he do with this sin? Does he go to Uriah and confess his sin? No. 
because, you know, that's what you probably should do. He plots to cover up his sin. But, you know, we like to do that too. Uh, We like to cover up and hide our sin. But guess what? It doesn't stay hidden. David's plan was very simple. He was going to call Uriah back. He was going to have him go and be with his wife. And so that when um, she announced that she was pregnant or when it became evident, then everybody would assume that that was Uriah's baby. But Uriah (laughs) didn't play along with the game. He didn't buy into David's plan at all. So he eventually had to, um, he sent Uriah back to the fighting, and then he instructed his leader to basically have him murdered. And so he died. And when when, uh, Bathsheba found out she was mournful and all of that, After Bathsheba's time of mourning was over, David brought Bathsheba to him, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. 2 Samuel 11, 27, which is the last verse um, in this um, chapter, says, But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And that's how the chapter ends. The thing that he had done had displeased the Lord. Now, I don't know up to that point if anything else that David had done had ever displeased the Lord, but this act displeased the Lord. And so we know that sin breaks God's heart, and it separates us from him. You may not have committed physical adultery, but we've probably all committed spiritual adultery. Um, we, you may not have plotted to have someone killed, but you may have lied, cheated to get ahead, embellished the truth, spoken harshly to a loved one, friend, or colleague, gotten angry at another driver on the road, used foul language, torn someone down rather than built them up, gossiped, had impure thoughts, yelled at your kids or your spouse out of frustration rather than taking a breath, given husband privileges to a boyfriend, those sins and more break the heart of God. They separate us from God, and they impact our relationship with God. So God sent Nathan, the prophet, to talk to David. I don't know if a prophet ever visiting you is a good thing. (laughs) In the Bible, it doesn't usually seem to be. Uh, so Nathan, and this is in Second um, Samuel chapter 12. So uh, Nathan said to David, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as, as much more. Why then? Have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly. But I will do this, this, this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. That's 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 14. To think that his sin was so great. David had everything that anyone could have wanted, but he was not content. 
he was not satisfied. And he thought he was above God's ways. Sin has consequences. Sometimes the consequences are not as immediate as David's child dying seven days after, after it was born. But sin can cause fractured relationships. It can cause health issues. It can cause, sometimes, and sometimes those health issues are lifelong. You know, you do one thing and then it affects you for the rest of your life. <clears throat> it causes mental health issues. It causes anger issues. It causes depression. It causes unhealthy relationships with men. It causes unhealthy relationships with food. Um, It causes a lot of unhealthy things. But above all, sin alienates us from God and sometimes turns us completely from God because we don't think God could ever forgive us. But here's a newsflash. He can forgive you, and he will forgive you. We also know from reading in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. This may not be a physical death. We may not physically die. We will eventually physically die, but your sin may not immediately result in your death. But it's definitely a spiritual death. The good thing is that God provides a way, as we know, being New Testament Christians, that God provides a way for us to remove our sin and bring us to a right relationship to him. But sin is very heavy. It's very heavy. And in Psalm 31, verses 3 through 4, uh, David writes, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. And we living in Texas, we know a lot about the heat of the summer. And we know how it goes on, and we know how heavy that can be, and how tired we get of it, and how ready we are for cooler temperatures to arrive. But we also can kind of get an idea of the heaviness. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was little, if, um, if I was misbehaving in public, you know, my mom or my dad would come and they would stand by me and they would, like, put their hand on my shoulder, maybe on my head, maybe on my back. And I knew from that touch that I was going to get it <laughs> in some form or fashion. And I had to live with that. For however long it took for us to get to the car or to the bathroom or to get home, right? Because that was heavy. That was a heavy burden to bear for me as a child when I was misbehaving. So this text says that night and day David was weighed down by his sin. It was a heavy burden. And it was a burden that he was never meant to carry, Never. He was never meant to carry that burden. And some of you are carrying around unconfessed sin, and it is weighing you down. It is weighing you down. It's affecting relationships. It's affecting your mental health. It's possibly causing health issues. Sin is a burden we were never meant to carry. Yes, it's a result of our own doing, but we were never meant to carry it. We are meant to be little tattletales with our sins. You know, little tattletales when you're like three, four, five years old. Oh, they did this. Oh, mama, they did this. Oh, they did. You know, we should be like that. We should be so ready to go to God and say, I did this. I did that. Forgive me. But we don't. We want to cover it up and we want to hide it. But the good thing is, David also provides us um, a model for acknowledging our sin and confessing it. In Psalm 32, 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
And also in the opening verses of Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Have mercy on me. Don't give me the punishment or judgment I deserve. I know the punishment that I deserve. I know it. But please show compassion to me. And sometimes we need to ask God to show us mercy, to show us his compassion, and to be kind and gentle with us in his rebuke. And sometimes... We need to ask God to show us our sin. Like David, who had seven days to sit with his sin, we sometimes need to sit with our sin and acknowledge the gravity of our sin and how it grieves the heart of the Father when we sin. It doesn't matter the human severity we assign to sin. In God's eyes, sin is sin. And it all separates us from God and the deep, intimate relationship he wants with us. Unless you commit the unpardonable sin, and that's unpardonable, and that is worse. So what are the benefits of acknowledgement and confessing our sin? First of all, you get a clean heart and a right spirit, restoration of the relationship with God, which is what we all want. In Psalm 51, 51, 10 through 12, you may remember this from the old Rich Mullins, not Rich Mullins, but Keith Green song. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. I never want the Holy Spirit to leave me. Never. And to think that David in his sin, said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Please don't take it from me. I've done this horrible thing, but please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Acknowledging sin establishes Christ's lordship over our lives. It reminds us that God is God, and we are not. That we live by his rules and not ours. In Romans six seventeen through 18, but thanks be to God that through that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Acknowledging sin enables us to experience God's grace. Ephesians 1, 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So when we, are, when we do confess, there are many blessings. Um, we are forgiven. Uh, blessed is the one whose transgression, transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's Psalm 32, 1 through 2. Um, Blessed is the man, this is the second verse, blessed is the man um, against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And then in Romans 4, 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. I am so thankful. I am so thankful for that. But because we have been forgiven, we can then extend forgiveness. In Matthew 6, 12, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And then again in Matthew 6.15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. We get protection and deliverance in Psalm 32.7, you, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You, del- you surround me with shouts of deliverance. We have hope in God's steadfast love. Psalm 32, 10 through 11, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And lastly, we are made more like Christ. When we acknowledge our sin, we realize that what we are doing and, what, and our actions do not line up with Christ and with God. And when we confess and we, when we repent and we confess, we are made more like Christ. So, what sins do you need to sit with, acknowledge, and confess tonight? The sin of unforgiveness, maybe? Maybe you've been hurt so badly by someone that you just can't let that go, and it's weighing so heavily on you that it affects your daily life and robs you of the joy and blessings God has for you. Maybe you need to pray, God, I'm not ready to forgive. Help me to forgive and forgive them for me until I am ready to forgive. Maybe you should get counseling or ask others to pray for you to help you get to the point of forgiveness. Maybe you need a Nathan in your life, someone who will challenge you to confront your sin. Or maybe you need to be a Nathan to somebody that you know and challenge them about their sin. Maybe your sin is erupting when you're frustrated and verbally attacking people. Maybe it's anger and rage while you're driving. Maybe it's not doing what God has told you to do. Maybe it's missed opportunities to serve, to comfort, or to share your faith. Maybe it's pride or arrogance. And I'll just be upfront with you that a lot of these come from my own personal experience. Honestly. <laughs> Maybe it's always putting on your happy face and pretending everything is okay when life is really falling apart and you need some support or help. Maybe it's your thought life, how you think about others, and what you say about yourself. Pray and ask God to show you the un unconfessed sins in your life. But remember... Once you've confessed a sin, it is forgiven. If it comes to mind again, you tell that little voice, I am forgiven. Go away. Okay? Don't come back. Don't give it visitation rights. Okay? It's gone, and it's gone. Now, if you, com if you commit the sin again, then you do have to confess again. But if it's something that you're not committing again, then it is gone. Don't carry it. Put it down and say, thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father, that you offer forgiveness freely when we come to you. Father, I, I am so thankful that you, you deal with us in mercy and grace. Father, that you do not give us what we deserve. Father, but you give us good things. Father, that you bring healing and hope and joy and comfort in our time of need. And I pray, Father, as we leave and as we go home, that you would protect us and help us to arrive home safely. Father, help us this week as we continue studying. I pray, God, that you would help us to work on our sin and realize that sin does separate us from you no matter what it is. It doesn't have to be anything major. Father, help us to run to you, to cling to you, to confess our sin to you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. <laughs>